So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Ben Briard, Solutions Architect based out of Dallas. Uh, we're good, right? Cool. Everybody can hear me wave if you can. not um, So I'm based out of Dallas. Really, really happy to be here with you guys. Um, and we're very fortunate today to have Leonard Pottering here, all the way from Berlin. So it's fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, two years ago, we would have needed barbed wire, but this is, this is great. Yeah. It's much better than why. Yeah. OK, so today, we're going to go we're going to go over system D from the system administrator perspective. Make sure everybody is comfortable with the concepts, the components, uh, just life with system D. And then we're going to get into what's coming around the corner in 7.2, which is going to come out later this year, most likely, right? It's not a strict schedule. Um, so yeah. How how many of you guys are running RHEL 7 in production today? That's a lot. How many plan to go later this year? That's, that's 70, 60 percent. What about next year? Yeah. So it's coming fast. So I assume everybody here is at least somewhat familiar with System D. How about this? Who has not used System D yet? It's OK. Safe place at the summit. Fair amount. So our, excellent. So everybody here is going to get something out of today's talk. And we're going to dive right in. It's a lot of material. This presentation is meant to be kind of a reference. So you guys can take this home with you after the summit and just read it and be the expert and share it with anybody you know. So that's the, that's the point of this. So Lennart, you want to give us an intro? Sure. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk a bit about what System D actually is. Um, it's, the, it's nowadays the default in system of most Linux distributions. Not really all of them, but pretty much all the commercial ones and all the big ones. Um, it uh, works differently than, than classic System 5 in it or Upstart worked in that it uh, um, manages a couple of different units. Um, what precisely we mean by the word unit, we'll see in a later slide. But basically, um, it ba breaks up the system into these units and then defines dependencies between them um, to boot up the system efficiently, as parallelized as possible, and um, re as reliable as possible, always knowing what depends on what. Um, so yeah, it's all about the dependencies. Um, who's calling me right now? Um, it's all about the dependencies between the units, right? Um, one of the most important unit types of services, we'll talk about that a little bit later too, um, a service is basically just a collection of daemons, of processes. Um, uh, these uh, uh, services are, uh, like, correspond to a C group, which you might have heard already. Like, C groups are something, like a kernel feature that was already viable in, in RHEL 6. It's basically a way how you can uh, group a couple of processes and apply resource limits to them. In systemd, every service has one of these C groups, and every process in the system is then attached to one of these C groups. So that the, the C group as the kernel um, uh, a concept basically are used to, to, to uh, petition the entire system and what runs into it into nice little units, right? So um, yeah, for every, every of the, one of these units, you can specify resource limits, including CPU memory. And we'll actually have quite a few slides about that later on. Um, so that you can basically say, yeah, Apache um, gets as much CPU as uh, MySQL gets um, if you run them on the same machine. Um, something that I always find very interesting to talk about is about the fact that because it, um, systemd always creates these C groups for every single service, there's for the first time on Linux a sane way how you can actually kill a service, right? Which might sound surprising because most people say, okay, they have run System 5 in it and Upstart for their entire lives and they never had trouble killing services. But actually, um, in systemd for the first time, you can do so reliably. By reliable, I mean that um, you not only kill um, the main process of the service, but everything that service might have forked off. This is especially relevant um, if you have Apache, for example. Apache is, a, is like it's the main daemon and has a couple of worker processes, and these couple of worker processes fork off CGI scripts, right? So if you want to make sure that you shut down Apache cleanly, you need to make sure that not only Apache itself is, is terminated, but all the worker um, processes and the CGI scripts, regardless what the CGI scripts do, if they try to really hard to, to de de disconnect from, from Apache above. So, um, because systemd maintains these 
kernel C groups for every single service, and because we can kill every process that is in these C groups mainly, we for the first time have a reliable way how we can imp implement that so that if you say you want to shut down Apache, that you can be sure that after that's completed, there's really nothing left uh, running anymore from Apache, no CGI script, no nothing. Um, then boot times are relevant as well. It was never at the core of what we wanted to do, but it's a side effect of a more efficient design, right? Because everything we start, we, we start in parallel, and every time we wait, we wait exactly for the minimal amount of time necessary for the actual events to happen. So in all of system, you will never see a sleep loop or anything like that. You will, we will always wait for exactly what we need to wait for. Um, this, this means um, effectively that if you run systemd in things like containers or VMs, that you can boot up the entire system in, in much less than a second. On, on physical hardware, it of course will still be a bit longer, but yeah, it's, it's like these boot times um, are really, really relevant, um, I think, um, in, in high availability setups and in, in setups where you, you quickly boot up a machine and then go um, make it go away. This goes as far, by the way, as um, you can set up servers now where you run a couple of containers and each of these containers runs uh, systemd inside and you only start these containers on demand when a connection comes in, right? And because the boot times of these containers are so, uh, so quick, you can even do that without having a latency being noticeable on the client side. Um, then debuggability, which is something I think is very important on classic system 5 in it. You always had the issue that, um, well, um, if you wanted to know what actually happened on the system during boot up, um, it was very difficult to get log message about that. Because if something happened in an inner RD or something like that, there would be no place where that would be logged. Some of the message you could get from the kernel logs, other messages would be scraped with a, cool, a tool called bootlogd from the screen, actually. But with systemd, it was always our goal that everything is logged on the system, right? And everything meaning everything from the kernel, everything in the inner ID, so it's basically a tempor uh, temporal everything, right? Like, regardless if it's generated in the f uh, first time of boot all the way to the last time of shutdown, it should be collected. But it also means that um, everything that is written to anything should be logged as well, right? Specifically, um, in systemd, if you start a daemon, right, and writes a log message to stdr instead of syslog, it will be logged by the journal, the journal will collect it as well. So it's very universal, the logging, right? Nothing that happens during boot should be lost anymore. And that is, that is like, I mean, if you, if you have been playing around with computers for a while, you know that most of the problems that you will probably have, and you actually wanna change, or a big chunk of them, you wanna actually check the logs, are actually what happens at boot, right? So this is really, really useful, I think. And uh, yeah, we try to be easy to learn. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's trivial and it's, there's nothing to learn, right? It just means that we think it's easier to learn a system D than it is uh, to learn classic system five in it. And uh, for us, it also matters a lot that we, on the hand, other hand, stay compatible to system five in it to a certain level, right? And we call it 99% compatibility. It's not 100% compatibility because system five is a very difficult target to be fully compatible with because people have extended it everywhere and there are lots of behaviors and in init scripts that were not standardized. But uh, um, yeah, in, in RHEL specifically, um, we provide you the, the command line tools like, like the service binary, for example, that you know from system five in it and we'll do the right thing on uh, um, systemd as well. Um, but again, it's not 100% compatibility, it's 99% co compatibility. Um, yeah. Fantastic. <clears throat> All right, so units. We talked about units as how the whole system is kind of, this is everything that systemd is watching. And, you know, the name here is, you know, it's name.type. So it's 12 kinds. Today, we're really going to focus on, oops, on, no. Yeah. We're going to focus on the top four there. Uh, so. Uh, this is a quick look at what a unit looks like. It's really short, easy to read. It's you know inspired by the INI file format type. Uh, it's, you know clear descriptions, and, and that's it. Now locations. I want to call this out because I don't know how many bad blog posts I've seen where this is wrong. Don't edit a unit file under user lib systemd system. This is where RPMs put. Uh, you know, put the unit files, and if you want to tweak them, we have a way to do that, but if you put them there, they're not flagged as comp files, they're gonna get overwritten. So, you guys are here, so now you're responsible for knowing <laughs> that, uh, you know, user lib systemd system is for RPM, ISVs, you know, Linux distributions, this is where, you know, we put packages and unit files, the administrator space is Etsy systemd system. And things that go in Etsy are gonna override 
user lib if they have the same name, okay? And then run system systemers for the non-persistent, uh, the runtime changes. And users can have their own, that's something else, but this is something I really want you guys to, to remember. So Lenart said we have backwards compatibility. You know, in the, in the init or rel five or six world, it's service, whatever your daemon is, start, stop. And system D, the system control is really the main, the main utility that, um, that you're gonna be using. Has anybody noticed something wrong? I see a couple get, yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, so it's system control, uh, it's done the correct way, right? So it's like every other command on Linux now, you put what you wanna perform the action on last. And that's probably the, the one thing when people, you know, switch between versions where you tend to get your fingers tied. How I keep it straight in my head is that we can glob units onto the end. So if I wanna restart Apache and MariaDB or whatever, just keep typing and it just takes care of it for you. That's how I keep it straight. Also, we don't have to type dot .service. We assume if you say HTTPD that, you know, if you don't provide the type of unit file, we're gonna assume it's a service. Which is important if you're working with sockets and timers, you really need to type that out or you could potentially do something on a, on a service. And then you guys, have, you guys that have used rel 7 know that we ship bash completion. I highly recommend that you use this package. It is the only way to not get it installed by default is if you choose a minimal install, in which case I would recommend that you add it to your minimal installs or your standard operating environments and so forth. All right, so checking the status. Again, really simple, system control status, whatever daemon you wanna see. If it cuts off the logs, pass uh, minus L for the full output, and again, this is just one of the really, really nice things. System D just makes our lives easy from the administrative perspective. We can see that it's loaded and running, it's set to enable on boot, you know, the main PID, all the worker PIDs for Apache, I can see current bandwidth, how great is that? And then I get the last 10, up to the last 10 log messages. That's pretty great, right? I mean, so I know half of you are like, yeah, whatever, I've seen this, and the other half are probably like, oh my, oh my gosh, why was this not in, Rel five, because it's been so long, all right. So let's talk about a couple other things that uh, we, need to, we need to know for system, system D. Uh, that's, you know, how do you view what's running on a, on a system? Say you inherit a box, what's, what's happening on that system? Type system control, we're gonna filter type service, so minus T service, and it's gonna show you what's running, so active or loaded uh, units rather. Uh, if you wanna see what's installed, right, so you know the check config list will show you what's on and off or enabled, disabled. This is gonna show you what's, um, you know, what's, what all's installed and on and off, basically. So it's more detailed output. Again, I'm going fast because we've got a lot to get to today. So hang, hang with us. Okay, so enabling and disabling, just like check config on, you can still use check config in RHEL 7, but I recommend that you use the right command. So system control, enable, disable, Again, globbing works great here too. Really, really easy way to clean up kickstarts and make them a little bit simpler. And then targets. So I, bad news is run levels are kind of deprecated concept, uh, but the good news is we have something better now, and that's targets. And, and it's really familiar because all the old names are symlinked. Uh, I think it's hilarious that run level two, three, and four are all the same target. Well, they only are on, on RHEL, right? right? On the Fedora, yeah. Like, one of the things with System 5 in it, I guess, is that um, it was differently implemented on the various distributions, right? Like, and, and um, Fedora and RHEL run three, four, and f uh, 2, 3, and 4, or something like that, were pretty much the same thing, and 5 was something different. So, um, yeah, we mapped that to a much simpler system, I guess, in, in System D. Um, like, we actually name it after what is meant by it, right? Yeah. Like, in run level three was usually the multi-user run level, and so we called it the multi-user.target. In run level five was usually the graphical um, run level, like, where you actually get your graphical UI, so we call it graphical target. But what's also important to know is that, um, um, in contrast to run levels, where you could only have one active at a time, you can actually have as many targets as you want active, right? So targets are basically just a way to group um, um, other kind of units or service and things like that. So um, yeah, we believe it's a, it's a much more powerful scheme because you can actually define your own groups and give them your own names. Um, and we provide you with a couple of suggested names, um, but you can extend that as much as you want. Yeah. All right. So, all right, if you guys feel like my daughter, we brought her home from the hospital, and do want a GUI, because I, I get asked this all the time. Hey, is there a GUI user interface for system D? 
there really is a fantastic one now, and it just landed in RHEL four weeks ago. Have you guys heard of Cockpit? It's playing in all the demo booths downstairs, but Cockpit is incredible. Really, really great UI for figuring anything, like networking, storage, users, but the service, you can you know, not only manage services, timers, sockets, it's, it's incredible. So again, great tool that's now in RHEL. Okay, let's look at sockets for a second. We have socket activation, native to systemd. And look how simple this is. We still ship uh, Zynet D, so you can run that like you always have. But if you want to do it natively with sockets, the important thing is that, uh, and, and this is part of the distro, but you know, apply this if you're thinking of a different use case. Make sure the names match, so TFTP is the same for socket and dot service. Define what type of socket, there's several you can, you can use, but this type is you know, socket datagram, and this will point to, you know, obviously port 69 for TFTP. And then all that does, when you get a connection, we're gonna fire this off. And so let me add a bit here, like, yeah. uh, like a little bit of background what that actually is, right, like a socket, right? I mean, you, most of you probably know that, that socket is the way how you communicate over the network and, and Linux, right? And systemd um, is very strong on something we call socket activation. Socket activation, I already mentioned that earlier with the containers a bit, is something where you basically tell systemd, please listen on that port, on that IP port, and then when something comes in there, like a connection comes in, then activate some, some a process and actually pass it on to that. So this example does that for a TFTP service. We have just picked that because it's a very simple service and very easy to understand. But basically the, uni the unit file you see on the left encapsulates the socket. The unit file you see on the right is actually then the service that is started when a connection comes in, right? And in this case, it listens on, on uh, UDP port um, 69, which says the listen datagram thing. And then it starts this thing that's called user SBIN in TFTPD. The concept of uh, socket activation is not a new concept we came up with. It is uh, basically, it has been available in INA D for, for a long, long time, since the 80s. Um, it is, uh, SystemD supports a, a much more powerful model though than INAD because we actually support activation not just by one kind of socket but by many in, in, in parallel. And we also use it for parallelization at boot and not just for, for on-demand starting of services. Of course, um, this is only efficient if the service that starts up is very fast in doing so. If it would be very uh, slow, then you would notice that. But again, because uh, of all the parallelization that we have done with the entire boot process, um, the boot process is so fast nowadays that you can actually um, use the socket activation with a full container to start the full container only when the first connection comes in. It's a really, really powerful uh, thing. Um, and this really should just give you an idea how these things work. And you can actually manage both of these units independently, right? Like you can say tftp.socket, you can start and stop that at any time, which basically means that it's listening or not, and you can actually start and stop tftp.service individually as well, because the socket and the actual service that's running behind it don't need to be running at the same time, but if, if it happens that a connection comes in and the service is not running, it will be automatically restarted. It's a really powerful thing. In this case, you see the standard input equals socket. That's kind of the indication that it sh should use the INAD compatibility mode, um, because that is actually an INAD service and not a native systemd socket activation service. But yeah, it's, it's really powerful stuff. Yeah, and so we use the same thing for cockpit. So when you, when you install this in the RELX's repo, Usually we listen on port 9090 by default, you can act or enable cockpit so service, and then when you, or socket, excuse me, and then when you connect, it'll launch the, basically the web service, WS over here. Then when you disconnect cockpit, it happens to shut down after a few minutes, so it's, it's cool, cool implementation. I mean, this is particularly important for something like cockpit, because cockpit is like this web UI, how you can configure, configure your, your, your machine, but you probably, you don't want this web UI to, to consume uh, um, uh, CPU and resources all the time uh, when you actually don't need it. Because, I mean, let's face it, you will actually start cockpit maybe once a week or something and actually go to that. So with this kind of setup, you say, okay, let the system be listen on it and start cockpit when necessary. Um, to the outside, the difference is not actually uh, visible, but you're actually using close to zero additional resources to make a cockpit viable. And that's, that's just awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So timers, just really, really quick, because we got to keep, keep moving, but uh, timers is like the native uh, cron type functionality uh, you get with systemd. So these are just simple examples from uh, the FS trim stuff we have in, in section Fedora right now. But uh, you, know, you can get a really, really fine-grained detail, uh, especially like the on startup. If you want something to run at a particular interval, like you know, I, there's a million examples and several different uh, options you can pass. 
Uh, the neat thing I like is persistent and true. So if you shut down a system for a certain amount of time, it's aware of its schedule because it writes it to disk and stuff. And of course, we'll, we'll run the service one on, on the timer. So, okay. So really quick, customizing. So it's very, very helpful to change several things within what our defaults are. And first to see what's available. System D keeps track of almost 200 different, different things on a, on a unit. Uh, if you do show minus minus all, it's, it's a long list, right? So I, it's sensible default, so I don't recommend that you mess things. You're not sure what they are. But that's how you can query what's going on there. You can show specific uh, properties, and you know, in this case, I queried for restart, and it's set to no by default. So how do we customize them? So I, I ragged on some of, the, some of the blog posts out there earlier. This is the right way to do it right now. For rel 7.0 and 7.1, something better is around the corner. But it's very, very simple. So we're gonna make a directory under, under Etsy, right? Because this is our, our modifications to the system, system D system and then name.type.d, so httpd.service.d, and then make a file, something.conf, and put whatever you want to override from what we ship. You can extend or override or change anything. This example is gonna always restart, so if Apache ever dies in milliseconds, it's back up. CPU affinity will lock to the first four cores on this box and basically disable the oom killer. And then once you get it set the way you want it, you've gotta notify systemd about it. And if you don't, you'll get kind of a snarky reminder that you've been changing units. Just type system control daemon reload, okay? So do that once you're ready. Now, the, my favorite thing is when you check the status, you will then see that a drop-in's been applied. So if you ever inherit a box and, wanna, and you, has someone changed this, right? So it's a, it's a great way to just see that something has been modified. And if you wanna do it on the entire system, you can run systemd uh, delta, and this will diff everything from user Etsy and run and, and show you this, this example, you can see how these have been extended here. And I, I'd, I'd really like to emphasize on the usefulness of this tool, System B Delta, because it always allows you to see the differences between the, the original configuration that the vendor that Red Hat shipped or some other vendor, depending on software you're using, um, and your local changes, right? Because it will show you um, everything, like if you overrode a, a file, um, like a unit file that was in user with one in Etsy, it will show you real diff, like a unified diff, how you might know it from, from Unix. But it will also show you these drop-ins, um, like these extra files that are added on top. It's, a, it's an incredibly useful tool because you can always trace back what actually the changes where you can, can make, and it will tell you basically what you have to delete um, to get back to the original system, how the vendor intended it to be shipped by default. Yeah, we've really never had that, that before. Okay. So resource management, I'm sure we've been hearing a lot about control groups at Summit, right? This is core technology, very, very relevant today, especially in the container world and so forth. <clears throat> and effectively what we're doing is basically figuring out how a system is gonna behave under contention in most cases, right? How do we set SLAs for certain, certain processes, services, and so forth? Um, and the controllers we expose are CPU, memory, and block IO, and, and system D. So if you, you know, it, you, you guys can probably relate in some level. You got something with a memory leak or uh, some, some process runs that just clobbers everything. This is how w we take over, over the, ma the machine again. So here are, the, here are the three types that we carve up the, the machine. So we start with the slice, and this is basically an organizational unit, how we, how, basically how we carve up the system. We'll take a look at this in more detail in a second, but that's really what it's for. It's, is it the leaf or the node? from the C-groups terminology. Um, like the slice basically is the inner nodes, yeah. right? No, okay. But basically the slices of, so, so let's say if you're a web hoster and you wanna give each of your customers um, a certain amount of CPU, certain amount of memory, certain amount of whatever, um, then you would create the, the slice for that. You can actually turn that into an entire tree so that, it, that you can basically say, okay, the customer foo gets this much memory, but the department, um, the marketing department gets only that part of that. Um, so you can build up an entire tree, um, label things nicely, and, um, and things like that. And then you can attach the actual scopes and the actual services to the leaves of this tree, right? Where service is what we already talked about, and a scope is something, it's something very similar to a service. Um, it's basically like if the login session of a user happens, that's, that's put together in, inside of a, of a, of a scope. Um, like, I, I don't really want to go into too much detail where the difference between scopes and services are. Um, bottom line is really that both 
are um, like co a collection of, of individual processes. And you can assign them freely to this tree. And so you can basically say, yeah, um, uh, the Apache and MySQL that belongs to the marketing department of company Foo gets this much and is somewhat down there in the tree. But of the other company, we put it somewhere else. It's a very powerful way how you can, can, can partition the viable resources on your machine um, and distribute it to the various services that you have. Yeah, fantastic. So in RHEL 7, we moved to a single hierarchy for a control group. So everything, everything is under and you know, obeys the C group uh, hierarchy on the, on the system. We did not have this in RHEL 6, so you could have multiple, I guess, routes and then you know, processes that were not associated with the C group, didn't respect anything you set. So in RHEL 7, it's a, it's a much better implementation, and it's all done out of the box, so you don't have to configure anything to use it. Now, who, I guess a lot of people have seen this thing, CPU shares, right? It, is, does anybody need a good explanation on this? That was some of the feedback we got last year. Just a couple of hands. So I guess it, you know, we deal with concepts of time slices. I'll, I'll let okay. you. Yeah, let me talk about that. So, so here we see basically the, the basic tree um, that you get if you don't change anything on a, on a Fedora RHEL system, right? Um, it's basically, by default, you get user.slice, system.slice, machine.slice. In user.slice, you basically find everything that belongs to user code, like user sessions, whatever graphical logs in they, they might have. System.slice is where all the system services are, and machine.slice is where the, the, the virtual machines and the containers and things like that are supposed to be. Um, and then, uh, in this example here, you see that we assign CPU shares equals 1,024 uh, to each one of them individual. Um, these are called shares here, or you could call, also call them a weight. It basically means that from all the viable CPU, right, um, this is how they will be distributed, right? Like in this case, everybody gets the same amount, right? But if the, if the user.slice, if you wanna um, make sure that if, if, if CPU is scarce, that the user slice gets more, because it should still be able to interface in, uh, with the machine, you could say CPU shares equals uh, 2048. Actually, you can pick any random number you want. Um, but um, the available CPU time, if, if, uh, if it is scarce, it will hence be, be distributed according to these weights so that the total available CPU time is the sum of it all, and then everybody gets a share, um, like, yeah, a fractional mass from, very simple, actually. Right, and we can even make that more complex if you go to the next slide. So in this case, in this case we, we do the same thing and we split it up further, right? So this is also the default setup. It's, it's how, how uh, your machine is going to be partitioned if you don't configure anything explicitly. In this case, you get one slice for each user. The first one, user-1000.slice, um, is a slice for the user with a user ID 1000. And down there you have another slice, which is user-1001, that's user ID 1001. And then below that slice you have a scope, and inside of the scope you have a couple of processes. And in this case we, we also do CPU shares equals 1024, to, because basically on every level you have in that tree, um, you assign these weights, and everything that, like all the CPU that's available at that level of the tree is distributed according to the weights to all the children that are there. Yeah, so same applies for uh, services. I mean, this is, this is probably where I think most of you guys will find this valuable, is if you have something that's really critical, you can give it a, a higher weight, um, essentially assign more CPU when there's contention on the system. Uh, you know, VMs will be exposed to scopes as well as containers that register with MachineD as well. And this example is mostly talking about CPU now, but it's the same thing for memory or for I.O. You can always assign these things. Um, like in special, like in the case of I.O., for example, you also have these weight, this weight concept, but uh, there's also um, ways how you can uh, specify absolute limits. Like for example, for CPU, if you wanna say that um, it shouldn't matter what's actually viable for CPU, but um, that this customer should never get more than so and so many minutes per minute or so um, uh, of CPU, then uh, you can set that with CPU quota and actually declare that. And then even if the machine is idle, it will not get more than that. Yeah. And so you've got two really, really handy tools to help you get your, your head around, around the, the layout here. So system D CGLS C group list is gonna show you the current hierarchy, everything you can see, session, services, everything. You know, we'll page to less or whatever the default pager is, but this is just a, you know, like the first half of, of this particular system. And then the other one is system, system DCG top. So if you turn on things like CPU accounting and stuff, we'll, we'll look at that in one second, uh, we'll get the performance metrics. So we can actually see what those values we set, how they actually 
affect the system, right? How cool is that for tuning, right, at C group levels? It's critical. And the important thing to note here is like, this will actually show you the summed up information for all the processes of the individual units, right? So HTTPD is, of course, as mentioned, a big collection of different processes, like the worker processes, the CGI script. And in this case, you will see one line for them where all these processes are summed up, right? Like the entire memory usage is summed up, the entire CPU usage, and it's shown as just one value. Yep. All right, so here's how to turn that big easy knob. Uh, system control set property. Runtime will not be persistent and just call your unit and then set the value to whatever, whatever you need. If you want it to persist, so I mean obviously this is how I recommend you tweak and play and, and you know, get it right, dial it in, and then drop the runtime flag for it to persist. And we simply just write out a drop in file for this. And, this. and this stuff applies instantly, right? So you can use the CG top utility, you can see, oh my god, this service takes too much CPU, I would rather like that it, uh, um, uh, take less CPU, then you can play around with these param parameters and then see live in the CG top output how your CPU usage actually um, is changed by playing around with the weights. So, and actually what I would like to mention is that um, the two upper commands are actually completely identical to the lower commands, right? Like it's completely up to you if you create um, like a drop-in um, uh, unit file with a setting or if you use that command because that command will just do the very same thing, but it will just do it for you. So real quick look at the controllers before we move on. So these are the higher level controllers we have available in 7.0 and 7.1. CPU shares, which we've, we've, we've covered that enough, I think. And so uh, memory limit, so yeah, so if you turn on the accounting, that's what makes the value show up on CG top. And then the memory limit is very simple, just whatever you want to cap it at. It's a it, hard limit. Just to mention that, like, by default, the accounting is not on. That it has uh, performance reasons, because um, the memory accounting especially is relatively expensive. Um, so by default, no accounting. But if you want to actually make sense of CG top, you turn it on um, by simply using this head property command. And then, uh, yeah, you get the information you want. Yep. Now, block I.O., same kind of thing. The, what, I, what I do want to point out here is that the default uh, I.O. elevator on 7 is deadline, so you will have to go to CFQ uh, for the block I.O. wait to, to be respected. So keep that in mind if, if this is valuable for you. All right, so sorry for going fast. The slides are available. We've got to keep moving on. Okay, so what about taking existing init scripts? Um, let's just do a real quick refresher on what init scripts look like. It's a bash <laughs> program. Right, uh, define a bunch of variables, my functions. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna help this guy out. Obviously, he hasn't upgraded from rel six yet. I know that's that's so mean. All right, all right. So, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it just keeps going, guys. Um, okay, unit file. This is what it looks like now in rel seven. Uh, it's yeah, it's readable. It's clean. It's neat. I love it. So I mean, so something yeah. I would like to say to that one is actually what, what's important to note here, it's no longer a program, right? It's declarative, it's not imperative. So you basically, if you look at this and you parse it, and if you ask um, Systemd for it, you can get a list of properties. You can process them further for your monitoring tools or for whatever tools you, you connect to it, because it's no longer a program uh, where it's only visible for, for, for people who can actually read code um, what actually is happening, right? That is like this declarative way is, 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 is one of the benefits of, of, of the unit file concept because it's really, it's just any files. Yeah. All right, so we kind of already talked about the backwards compatibility. So again, we're not saying you have to convert init scripts. They will probably run just fine on RHEL 7. If they don't, that's what support's there for and we'll, we'll work through it with you. Uh, but I've, I'm not really running into any problems. So this is just a basic skeleton. So if we take, uh, you know, kind of just a simple double forking uh, application, uh, you know, give it a description after. If you need to define dependencies, we can do it up here. There's quite a few lists, so we're not going to dive into the details of this, but it's very, very well documented. And then the basic thing under service, we're just going to call the binary, put it in daemon mode. That if it's double uh, forking, we'll call it forking. There's other types too. Simple is the default, which will work for a lot, of, a huge amount of things as well. And then one shot for like just commands or scripts you want to fire off. We'll give it a PID file, and then where do you want it to come up? You know, multi-user is by far the most common here, unless it needs to come up at a different point in the the boot process. And and that's about it. So, you know, it took me I don't know 20, 30 minutes to do this with EAP, which is has a pretty long init script back a year ago. So we just want to really quickly look at a couple things here. If you find, 
you know, defining environment variables. We could have put these in an environment file under sysconfig, which is really, really common. Uh, give it a user. I didn't define the type, so it's going to be a simple service. The other thing you'll see here is I defined a slice for JBoss slice. This is going to give me another top level slice and make JBoss, uh, you know, the e equal top level like we saw user and system a minute ago. JBoss would be at the top level. So if, if the whole system was under contention, that would guarantee JBoss would always get 33% you know, of the CPU, for example. I'm not necessarily saying you should do that, but this is a great way if you have a use case to do it. Very simple. And that's it. Okay. Okay, let's quickly um, go over this. The journal is a, is a com <laughs> component of Systemd that uh, is about logging, uh, because we always thought that one of the most important parts of service management is actually logging, right? Like, if you, if you want to know if a, if a service is healthy, um, you need to know, you need to be able to see um, the, the last log output it generated. So um, in the system control status outputs we showed earlier, you'll always have this little bit um, below where it shows you the 10 last log lines of a service that generated. And the way we implement that is through the journal. The journal um, is something, it's a very, very deeply integrated component because as I mentioned earlier, uh, it was really important to us that, that all the logging is collected regardless how it, is, it happens and when it is ha is happens. And the journal has this, is basically this concept where all the logging of the entire system is collected and put into one big pool. And then you have a very powerful journal control tool um, that you can actually access it. Like this journal control tool, um, is, it will generate an output that is pretty much identical to the classic var log messages thing. Um, but you can actually filter things, right? Like, um, because um, the journal is generally structured and a lot of the structured fields that are inside of it are generated implicitly. So basically, for every log line, we always know which unit generated it, and which uh, user generated, and which process ID generated, and so on and so on. And you can, because this is always stored away in the database, you can use journal control to filter things, right? Like, so you can easily ask it, please show me um, all the logs that were generated by Apache, or everything by MariaDB. Um, or you can say, please, everything by this user, or everything by this PID. You can even combine these matches. Um, it, it's a relatively powerful thing. Implicitly, we apply like 30, like we add like 30 different um, uh, uh, implicit um, fields to every log message to, uh, to make this filtering very powerful. Um, like just looking at the output, like if you just want to see the system logs this way, you can just type journal control. Um, it is already much nicer than var log messages because it actually um, saves a lot more information, like including, for example, the log priority. Um, because in classic the RSS logs, this is not actually stored on disk unless you turn on some special uh, format where it is. But we use this information to pre make the presentation to the user more interesting. Like for example, um, uh, what it shows here is that, uh, uh, what it says here is that the, the um, errors are actually highlighted in the log messages, right? Like everything that has a log priority of error or higher is, is, is shown in red. Everything that has a higher log priority than log info, which is like the normal way how you to log something, um, will be highlighted in, in, in white or bright, or this one says bold. Um, so uh, if you look at this, it's already a lot more useful than classic logs because you can very quickly identify the bits where it actually matters where actually something really bad happened, right? Um, yeah, and then there's a couple of other things that John is really about is like this security thing is, is, is important to me, to me personally at least. Um, I always thought that logging um, it needs to have security built in in the sense that um, it should not be possible to the logging clients to pretend to be something else than they actually are, right? Because that is an issue with classic syslog. Like if, if the CGI script pretends, like it claims it is actually MySQL, right? Then it can do so, the, the syslog implementation will store it away and that's it, right? Like, and then if you come back as an administrator and look at it, there's no way how you can dis dis distinguish the actual messages generated from MariaDB from the messages that by the CGI script that just pretended to be MariaDB. So um, what the journal actually does, it has this concept of trusted and untrusted fields. Untrusted fields are actually generated by the application itself. The trusted ones are um, fields that are um, implicitly generated by the journal and cannot be faked, right? It's basically data that we get from the kernel directly and um, cannot be altered by the application themselves. Um, this is really, really useful for if, if somebody exploits your machine um, and you want to figure out what's actually going on, you want to make sure that he cannot really hide his traces and that the logs that are um, belong to some services are not suddenly show up as logs of something different just because he um, exploited that and pretended to be something else. 
But yeah, then, then I mean, we try to fix a couple of things with the journal. Like one other thing is the, the rotation. Um, rotation for us is always synchronous, right? Because we always thought that one of the big problems with syslog is that uh, rotation happens by time. That basically means that um, if somebody manages to generate a lot of log messages on your system, um, uh, you might be able to flood um, the, the, the var partition, basically. Um, and it would only be by time that it would be cleaned up. So you always have this time window where the disk might be um, uh, filled up um, until it gets cleaned up again. Uh, hence, for the journal, we, saw, uh, we, we decided the rotation has to be synchronous, right? Like every time we write something new to disk, we first decide if we actually should delete something uh, um, else so that we can actually decrease the disk usage again. Has anybody ever filled up a var partition with logging? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> We've all, yeah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, but, I mean, the journal is, a, is probably, a, it could be an, another talk um, where we could yep. talk about three hours or something. Um, yeah, so um, again, in RHEL 7, actually the journal is, is enabled by default, but it, we also install our syslog. So, um, because, you know, the journal is a new thing. It does not speak the old um, BSD syslog protocol over the network. Um, hence, uh, our syslog is the default in RHEL 7. Um, in addition to the journal, so that um, basically the journal gets all the messages first. The journal collects all the messages from the early boot process, from SCD out, SCDR, adds a lot of metadata, and then our syslog pulls that out and, and saves the disk in an additional format. The, the effective thing is actually that everything is stored twice, right? So um, yeah, the, the journal in RHEL 7 is also not persistent by default. Um, so to make it the, not that bad that it's uh, stored twice, um, the journal will actually just store something in slash run that is volatile, it's a memory that never hits the disk unless it's uh, swapped out. Um, and uh, the, the RSS log is a persistent thing. But you can actually turn that around, like if you like the journal, um, then you can switch that over. Um, yeah, the journal control command, I already man mentioned that is a really, really powerful command to actually query the journal. It has a, a command completion, so it's, it's like we mentioned that earlier, the bash completion package, absolutely install that because it's really, really, like it improves your life a lot because then you can actually press tap, tap and actually see how you can filter through things. Um, but yeah, let's, let's go to the next one. Okay, so there's kind of this awkward elephant in the room uh, in the container space, <laughs> I don't know how much you guys keep up with this, but there's a lot of players, right? And, uh, I want to be crystal clear that with RHEL 7, kind of the, the supported thing that, that we're backing from an enterprise perspective is Docker, Kubernetes, we ship these in the extras channel, or repository, uh, and then of course, if you really want to roll them out of the enterprise, that's going to be OpenShift 3 and the Atomic Enterprise Platform that Paul just announced. We also have this tool with systemd called Inspawn, which we're gonna take a look at here because it's very, very useful and it works really well. So Inspawn is, like we said, it's native to systemd, and I'm gonna go quick so we can leave time for questions here. But basically, if you wanna set up a small uh, Inspawn cheroot, this is the simple steps here. We're gonna do a yum install to a root. So in this case, I'm gonna do varlib container and then whatever name you wanna put it to and install just the bare minimal packages. This will end up about 360 megs, roughly. And then from there, we can just fire that up. So it's systemd inspawn, pointing at the directory. This will give you a bash prompt. If you want to add a command here, you know, kind of like what you used to with like Docker and stuff, you just fire up whatever you want. It's instant. Cool thing is, is we can also kind of boot that user space. So if you want to do that, again, I'm going fast, hang with me. Uh, we'll point to a directory. We'll configure a root password. You know, configure any daemons if you want. Those are the ones I like to turn off out of the out of the gate. And then from here, we'll we'll run the same command, but we'll add minus b for boot. And then in you know 67 milliseconds, I get the full system D startup experience with the kernel. It's a really really useful way. I use it for testing stuff all, like all the time if I don't want to mess with a VM or so forth. So this is a really cool tool that is in rel seven. So we just wanted to highlight that. Um, and then to make yeah. this to make this clear how this relates to the other container stuff, Anspawn is a very low level tool. Um, it's really just like the focus is very strictly on on booting. It's something that is, resembles more a complete operating system, right? Like in Docker, that's usually microservices or something like that, where you only have one service inside of Docker. With Anspawn, it's really more like like a container manager that works like a virtual machine manager would work, like right? that you actually boot a real operating system in there. Um, it is, like we've wrote it mostly for, for debugging and, and, and things purposes, um, like 
debugging, testing, building things. But actually, it's generally useful now. Um, and uh, um, like like Rocket, if you have heard of that, um, which is something like Docker, but not. Um, actually uses Anspawn as the actual backend to implement the containerization. So um, if you think about Anspawn, um, you can say that Anspawn is like KVM, right? Because the fewest people actually use KVM directly. Most people, if they want to use um, uh, like VMs, they, they use something on top like, like libvirt and OpenStack and OpenShift and what, whatever they are called. But Anspawn is really just a low level bit like KVM and it doesn't distribute anything and things like that. So that's, that's um, just to clear up a bit how Anspawn and Docker relate and that they are very different areas that they try to focus on. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're gonna skip ahead to what's coming in 7.2. We're likely gonna get a newer version of System D. I'm not promising, legal got to me, so we're not making any promises that this is likely gonna come down the pike uh, later this year. And a couple of the highlights we wanted to call out that just nice refinements that are going to be really beneficial to you guys. Uh, probably the biggest one on a daily basis is system control. We get, uh, now we get these two new options for edit and cat. If you want to quickly view a unit file, you can do system control, cat, HCPD, boom, there it is. You want to edit it, this is the same for making a drop in. System control, edit, you know, your unit file. Boom, you're in BIM or whatever editor you use. Type in whatever you want, save it. You no longer have to create that directory uh, and the file and so forth. You can still do that, but this is just a really clean, fast way to get it done quick. Great, so we're adding a new CPU quota, which Lenart talked about earlier. This will drop in 7.2, so you can set a hard cap for processes, or services, rather. Uh, Systemd socket proxy. You can add socket activation to daemons that don't support socket activation. Like the really example is stuff like Nginx and things of that nature. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, and then Inspawn matures a lot in the next one. And then there's also something interesting called NetworkD. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but it's, it's really a, way, a simple way to configure networking with you know, basically unit type files. Uh, and it's, it supports quite a lot of kinds of connection. It's not as mature as uh, Network Manager, uh, but it's, you know, it's super easy to use, really, really so good. So basically the, the, the reason why NetworkD exists is that we wanted to have something very, very low level, very simple, very, very minimal, so that we can actually cover a couple of uh, use cases where Network Manager is not uh, right, currently used or usable, which is like, for example, we wanted some networking solution that we can run in the NetRD, like during early, early boot, and uh, something that run, can run in container and can make sense out of it. So and I think NetworkD is a nice alternative network manager, um, but uh, um, it's not the, like, like in, in RHEL, the default is network manager, right? And it, it will stay that way for a while. Yeah, um, absolutely. But it might be an alternative for, for smaller setups and uh, more embedded setups and more containerized setups. Yep, and, and actually right now, we're not 100% sure if this will land in 7.2 or 7.3 or be an optional repository. If you guys have a use case around NetworkD, you know, we'd love to capture that, so just come, come talk to us. Um, okay, so those are everything before we go to Q&A, uh, but there's tons of resources on the customer portal, uh, everything else. Lenart's done a lot of writing about this stuff. I'm sure a lot of you guys have read. I highly recommend you go read read all of those blog entries and so forth. And then of course, you know, there's the entire Red Hat ecosystem behind it. So please remember to fill out your survey. That's the only way we're gonna get this guy back next year. So uh, everybody do that. And what, you wanna take some Q&A, do we have time? Yeah, we will we be like, outside also. But yeah, we have like five minutes for Q&A, so. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, thank you. How about come up here if you have Q&A, because it's going to get noisy with people leaving. But yeah, come on up if you have questions, and then we'll, we'll go outside. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.